So as I post this video today, which is the 27th of March, 2024, we have a little over one month left for your P3 and P4 exam in the May June series. And so far on my channel, I have been posting a lot of content relating to AS psychology. A lot of students have asked me to start uploading some content on A2 as well. Now, I don't have much time to be uploading a lot of videos on the content, but I've realized that within this time that we do have, what I can do is let you guys know how to answer questions for paper three and paper four. And more so than answering the questions, just kind of brief you through the exam format. Because uh, most of you would probably know that the, the past papers may not be too useful to you because the exam format has changed. So just like how in AS psychology, some of the studies have changed, the syllabus has changed a bit for AS. The, the syllabus is almost exactly the same for A2 as it was previously. The major difference is the new exam format. And I keep telling my students that if anything, the new exam format is a lot easier than what it used to be. So if you take a look at some of the grade thresholds of previous years for A2, an A in P3 would perhaps be within the mid to low 30s out of a 60. And for P4, I've seen for a particular, particular year that an A in P4 was as low as a 29 out of 60. So that's less than 50% and you still would potentially get an A. So reason being, previous exam format would be a little tough in the sense that students would struggle to try and complete the entire exam within the one and a half hour time. And another big difference between AS and A2 is in terms of the exam format is in AS, students are required to write their answers in the lines given below um, the question. So you have a certain number of lines, limited number of lines within which you have to answer the question on the question paper. In A2, that's not the case. In A2, you'll be provided with answer sheets and you will be required to write longer answers. So you don't have that restriction when it comes to the number of lines you have within which you must write your answer. So I will discuss how the paper has changed from the previous P3s and P4s. So today we're discussing the P3 specimen paper and make another video for P4. So today I'm just gonna discuss the P3 format. What is expected? What changes have been made to the format? And a few tips on how to answer the questions. So paper three is referred to as your specialist options, approaches, issues, and debates. Now, considering it's March, many of you at this point in time, hopefully should know that you have to attempt two of four modules. For those of you who will be perhaps taking your A2 soon, maybe in the October series or next year in um, May, June or whenever, you will learn that there are four modules in A2. In AS, there are just 12 studies. There's the research methods chapter and that's mainly what you're supposed to know for your exam. For A2, you have four modules, so it's slightly different from AS. Instead of having 12 fixed studies split into four approaches, you have four modules. And students get to select two modules that they wish to attempt in their exam. And these four modules are clinical psychology, which was previously referred to as abnormal psychology or psychology, uh, which is basically psychology of um, different disorders. So the content is pretty much the same, but they've just changed the term name of the module. It's no longer called abnormal, uh, abnormality, it's called clinical psychology. So there's clinical psychology, there is health psychology, there is consumer psychology, and then there is organizational psychology. So students with a commerce background who might have business studies as a subject, they may prefer 
consumer psychology and particularly organizational psychology because there are some overlapping topics in between the um, content for organizational and organizational psychology and business studies. So there will be that element of familiarity when you study organizational psychology if you are a business student. However, the way you answer questions for a psychology exam would be very different to how you would answer for a business exam. So the content might be similar, but the way of answering questions is going to be very different. Now, you have the options to select the two which you wish to do. Clinical psychology is based on, as I said earlier, different disorders. And in my opinion, it's perhaps the most interesting of the four modules. Keep in mind, these aren't the only four modules in psychology. Later on in university, you can perhaps pick other fields of psychology, sports psychology, psychology. Previously in your A-levels used to have um, educational psychology. So ways on improving the um, education of students and understanding their psychology. That has been replaced now. Uh, consumer psychology has been re-added, I believe. Uh, I think it used to be there previously. It's been now reintroduced. But you get to pick two of the four. Now, this is not always the case because at least in Pakistan, um, it depends on your school where if you get a teacher who has chosen to teach, let's say clinical and health, then in that case, you would not have the option to pick consumer or organization. So you would go with what your teacher is teaching. Unless of course you decide to do it maybe privately and study it on your own and then attempt the exam for another module which is something students do also do, but it's not recommended because then you would be doing two particular models in school with your teacher, and then you'd be doing maybe one or two others privately, which means you'd be covering four entire modules. And that would be a lot of content for you to cover up considering you might have other subjects to study for as well. And A2 definitely isn't a piece of cake. So you, if you have the option to select the two, you can maybe go over each and see which one you're more inclined towards. And if you don't, then you would have to pick the two that your teacher is teaching. So you have in paper three questions on mostly issues and debates on application of um, the topics, chapters for two of the modules you've chosen. So let me show you what the exam looks like. Now, there is a section A, which is clinical psychology. And you have to answer, as you can see the instructions, it says over here, answer questions from two options. So you have the option to choose which two modules you wish to pick, you wish to study, or which, which, whichever ones you have studied for. Obviously, if you've been studying for clinical and health for the entire year, you're not going to open the exam and then attempt consumer, right? So you would obviously attempt what you studied for. The two options you are choosing in paper three, you would obviously also have to attempt in paper four. So if you've done clinical and health in paper three, you can't opt for clinical and organization, let's say in paper four. Now there are no options in terms of answering questions. You must answer all questions. There are four questions in each section. So section A is clinical psychology. And if you scroll through the entire exam, you will see that all four modules will be present there. So just because you study clinical and you studied health, you will not have a separate question paper with just questions on clinical and health. When you open the exam sheet, the question paper, you will see all four modules will be there. Like over here, you have section A for clinical psychology. You scroll down, you have section B for consumer, section C is health, and section D is organizational psychology. So all four modules will be present in the exam. You need to write down the section of whichever one you are attempting and attempt the questions for those. There are four questions in each section, as you can see over here. Question one, two, three, and four. And the questions are mainly either two markers or four markers, except for the last question, question number four. As you can see, question four A is for six marks and four B is for 10 marks. Otherwise, question one, two, and three, it's split into four and two markers, okay? Now, how is this different from the previous P3 paper? The previous P3 paper, again, you would have to pick the two modules, but the structure was such that, and if let's look at the total number of marks first. So 
Paper three is one hour and 30 minutes long, just like paper one and two for AS, and it's for 60 marks, right? So you have 90 minutes to attempt a 60 mark paper. And if it's 60 marks in total, and you're picking two modules, then the breakup is 30 marks for one module and 30 for the second. So if you're attempting clinical, then the four questions in clinical would add up to 30 marks and the four questions in, let's say health would add up to 30 marks. Let's see if that is the case. We have question one for four marks, then question two A for two and two B for two. So that's four plus two plus two, that's eight. Then another four marker, which is 12, 13, 14, then a six marker, which adds up to 20, and then a 10 mark evaluation, which makes it 30. And just like this, you have the same thing for the other modules as well. So you have to attempt two uh, options, two sections, which will give you a total of 60. And in all sections, as I said, it's split into four questions. And how is this different from what it used to be? Previously, for let's say if it was the section for clinical psychology, you would have one two mark question followed by a four mark question followed by a six mark question. And now that six marker is not the same as this six marker you see here in 4A. That was a different type of six marker, maybe on the strengths and weaknesses of a certain aspect of the study or chapter that is no longer included. Um, maybe you might have to compare, um, let's say, the use of drugs to CBT as a form of treatment for a particular disorder, that is no longer the case in this new exam format. So you would have a two marker, a four marker, a different type of six marker. Then you would have an eight and 10 marker. So you would have two questions. Question one would be of three parts, A, B, and C, all on one chapter. And it would be split into two marks, four marks, and six marks. And question two would be on another chapter from that particular component, from that particular model, module. And that would have two parts to it as well. An eight mark question and a 10 mark question. Now we still have that as a four marker, as, sorry, the question four over here, we still have the exact same format for the eight and 10 marker, but the difference is the eight marker has now been reduced to a six marker. So the format for that question would be, it would be a describe question on a particular topic for eight marks, followed by an evaluation question on the same topic for 10 marks. We have that exact same thing here in question four, where there's a describe question on a particular topic, like as you can see here, psychological explanations. And then there's an evaluation on the exact same topic, which is psychological explanations. But the difference is, it's no longer an eight and 10 marker, it's now a six and 10 marker. And obviously a six marker means you would have to write less than an eight marker. So less writing is obviously easier, which means you'll be able to complete the paper on time, at least a lot more easily than previous years. Because this is all remember for just one module, then you would have to do the same for health. So in the previous format, you would then have to do a two, four, six marker question for health, and then an eight and 10 marker for health. So, that means you're required to do two evaluations, right? Because if this is the format for clinical, then this would be the format for health or let's say consumer. For those of you taking consumer, the reason I'm not focusing too much on consumer is because I personally myself do not teach consumer. I do teach the other three modules, but let's take a look at consumer for those of you who are consumer psychology students. As you can see, it's the same format. There's a four marker, then a couple of two markers, then two, two, two. And then the last one would be a six and 10 marker. So you're essentially required to write two evaluations. Right? In AS, we were used to writing one evaluation. Now you have to write two. So going back to the point about a lot more writing compared to AS psychology. Okay. The format for the evaluation is also slightly different. In fact, it's a lot different from what it was in AS. Now let's take a look at the format for the questions. Now the questions will be mostly on content from chapters in the syllabus relating to their application and also relating to the issues and debates. Now, in AS psychology, the issues and debates that were relevant to our studies were the in nature nurture debate, the individual situational debate, and you had application to everyday life. And you also had the use of children and use of animals in psychological research. Now, all of those are still relevant to A2 studies 
except for use of animals because we don't really have any animal studies in A2. But you still have use of children in psychological research. You still have the application to everyday life um, point, which is still part of your A2 syllabus and the nature nurture debate, as well as the individual situational debate. So that is still important for A2. Along with that, you have some new issues and debates introduced in A2, which you may or may not have covered in AS. And these are determinism versus holism, reductionism versus, um, sorry, it's reductionism versus holism, determinism versus free will, free will, nomothetic versus ideographic. And then you have cultural differences. And in research methods, they've just added this fancy term, which we refer to as psychometrics, which is essentially like closed ended questionnaires. So some new, um, topics being added to the issues and debates part of A2 psychology. And questions can be on these aspects, on these topics in paper three. So let's take a look at the first question. This is on the chapter of mood disorders. So they've given a little scenario here. They've come up with an individual whose name is James. So it says James has a mood affective disorder and has started to receive rational emotive behavioral therapy. REBT. For those of you familiar with this chapter, they are referring to the psychological treatment of depression. Um, one of the topics in that is Beck's cognitive restructuring. The other, which they're referring to, is REBT by Ellis. At the first session, James tells the therapist that he has been having problems at work. He feels that he has nothing to contribute in his team. He also thinks that his manager does not like him and this is causing him distress. So they've come up with a hypothetical scenario similar to something you might have seen in paper two or even in paper one in some questions for AS. Explain how REBD can help James with his distress, four marks. Now they've given you this whole scenario with this individual named James who's suffering from, uh, it seems, depression. And they give you examples of how it's affecting him at work and um, perhaps reasons as to why he's feeling depressed or distressed at work. He is planning on using REBT as a form of therapy to help him reduce his depressive symptoms and his distress. Explain how REBT could help him with his distress. So if you think about it, this is just an application to everyday life question. It's just a very fancy way of asking you, what is, how can REBT be applied to help someone reduce their depression? And they've given you a particular example of a case where someone is going through depression. So you just have to apply REBT and its concepts, the therapy. Um, because it's a four marks, you would have to show some knowledge of the content. You would have to know that you understand what is happening in this particular form of therapy. So maybe introduce or give an introduction uh, in your answer about what REBT is, how it work, works, and then gradually transition your answer into applying REBT on James to help him reduce his distress in the situations that he's going through. So like I said, this is mainly an application to everyday life question, which you came across quite a few of in um, paper one in AS psychology. Now let's look at question number two. Question number two, A and B, split into two parts. And this is almost always a question on the issues and debates, right? And it can be on the ones you've covered in AS. It can also be ones. Uh, it can be also on the ones which you covered in A2. So this one over here, 2A, is one which you should be familiar with from your time in AS. Outline what is meant by the nature versus nurture debate. Okay, pretty simple question for two marks. Nothing too complicated here. However, there's a part B. Explain one weakness of explanations for impulse control disorders from the nature side of the debate. So. The first one was very simple. They're asking you to simply describe the nature versus nurture debate. Question 2B is slightly more complicated. There are a few aspects of this question which we need to focus on. Explain one weakness of explanations for impulse control disorders. Now, impulse control disorders is an entire chapter. It's one of the five chapters. And one of the sections under impulse control disorders is the explanations, right? For those of you studying clinical psychology, you'd be aware that every chapter has three main sections or three main topics, the diagnostic criteria, the explanations of that disorder, and the treatment and management of that disorder. 
So they're asking you about that second section, the explanations of impulse control disorders. What is the weakness of the explanations of impulse control disorders? But they're not asking you to write any weakness. They're asking you to write a weakness of the explanations of impulse control disorders from the nature side of the debate. So if you are going to be, so in other words, they're simply telling you that the explanations of the impulse control disorders, which are favoring the nature side of the debate, what is one weakness of that? So under the explanations, we have psychological explanations and we have biological explanations, right? So biological explanations are the one you would expect to maybe favor the nature side of the debate. If they are favoring the nature side of the debate, what is the weakness of that, okay? Um, it's reductionist, for example, because it's only focusing on the role of biological factors and the role of brain chemistry, chemicals, genetics in explaining the onset of certain disorders and behaviors, and it's, it's ignoring the role of environmental factors, which would obviously lower the validity. So by not only, so when you're going over your issues and debates, you should not only know the definitions of the issues and debates, you should also know their strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so you should, because they could very easily have also asked you, what is one strength of the explanations of impulse control disorders from the nature side of the debate? So it is important to go over the strengths and weaknesses of the debates as well, not just the definitions of them. So, and you're not really required to write too much because people are probably wondering how much are we supposed to write? Because in AS, if it was the two marks, we'll be required to write around four lines. They're writing six, seven in A2, which is also fine. But if it's for two marks, remember there's no negative marking in psychology, but uh, you'll just be taking up a lot of valuable time which you need to answer questions because remember, it's not just clinical psychology. There's a whole another module that you also have to attempt. Question number three. So another somewhat of a hypothetical scenario. Asha is a student at school who has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, okay? So another question from the chapter mood disorders, this time about bipolar. Explain two characteristics of this, of this disorder which might affect Asha at school. This is also somewhat of an application question, but it's more content-based because now you're required to actually know two characteristics of that particular disorder. And the characteristics of that disorder come under the section of the diagnostic criteria. So this is more about the first section of the mood disorders chapter. Whereas the first question was on the last section, the treatment and management. This one is also on mood disorders, but on the diagnostic criteria. So you should know, you should have enough knowledge on the criteria, the characteristics, the features of different disorders. And once you know that, you will have to actually apply it in a situation that they've given you. So you don't have to talk about how it's affecting her just generally. You have to talk about how it's affecting her in a particular situation, how it might affect her at school, all right? In terms of her interaction with her peers, with her, with her teachers, how would it affect her academically and so on. So if you know the content really well, if you're aware of the features, then you would just have to use a little bit of intelligence on your own part and common sense and talk about how you can apply it, um, those features, um, on her and how it would affect her in this particular example situation that they've given you. Question 3b, explain one strength of the diagnostic guidelines. So as we know, this is a question on the diagnostic criteria. So they're asking you, what is one strength of the diagnostic guidelines of the mood disorders? So this is for two marks. So again, no need to elaborate too much. Just talk about one simple strength. Um, it's standardized. It's... Um, got a certain set of um, standardized criteria for explaining um, a disorder, what symptoms need to be met in order for us to diagnose a particular disorder. And if anything, it'll just help increase the validity because if we've got a certain set of diagnostic guidelines, then we can match the symptoms of a patient for a particular disorder with what is mentioned in those guidelines. And if the person meets those symptoms, that criteria, then we can make a valid diagnosis of the person's condition rather than misdiagnosing them with perhaps a different disorder and as a result of that, not treating them correctly. So just a little example of how you would answer this. Moving on to question four, 
this is now the six and ten marker. So question four is essentially for 16 marks split up into part A and part B. Now the one thing you will notice is, which I mentioned earlier as well, 4A and 4B, the last question will always be on the same topic. Not necessarily the same chapter, but within the same chapter, the same topic. So the chapter is OCD and the topic is psychological explanations. I told you that the first section is the diagnostic guidelines, the diagnostic criteria, the second is the explanations, and the third is the treatment and management. So again, those of you studying clinical psychology, you should be aware of the fact that under the explanations, you it is split into two types of explanations, psychological explanations and biological explanations. Same with treatment and management. You look at any chapter in clinical psychology, all of them, uh, that have the section of treatment and management. The treatment and management section will be split into two types of treatments and managements, which are psychological treatments and biological treatments. Now, previously, what they would do is, for this, this particular describe question, they would ask you to describe the entire section. So over here, they've said describe the psychological explanations. If this was 2023, the question would be describe explanations of OCD, not just psychological explanations, which would mean both psychological and biological. And it would be for eight marks, not six. So that's why it's for six marks because they're not asking you to evaluate the entire section, but instead a part of it. And they've even mentioned specifically what comes under the psychological explanations, the cognitive explanation, the behavioral explanation, and the psychodynamic explanation. For those of you who might forget what falls under that particular section, they've mentioned it in the brackets. Now, there is no guarantee that they will always mention it in the brackets. In the 2023 October paper, for some of the modules, I think for let's say organization and health and consumer, I think if they gave a particular topic, they did mention the studies or the subtopics in brackets that fell under that section. But for organization, sorry, for clinical, they didn't. For I think the Mayjun paper, they did mention it in the brackets for clinical. So at your end, you should still just go over exactly what topics, what theories, what studies fall under each particular heading in case they don't give it to you in brackets um, as they have done in this particular example. So describe the psychological explanations. Okay, so not overall explanations. They're not asking if biological. They could very well have easily asked you about biological as well, but they're not. So describe the psychological explanations of OCD. Now, a described question is simply a summary. You are not required to write the strengths and weaknesses. You're just simply required to very briefly explain the cognitive explanation, what it's talking about, give a brief summary of it, give a brief summary of the behavioral explanation, which was the operant conditioning for OCD, positive and negative reinforcement, and then the psychodynamic explanation by Freud, okay? A six mark answer should be at least a page long, maybe around, if you want to max one and a half page, no need to extend it to two pages, it's only six marks. So no need to give each and every single detail, just mention the main points, if it's a theory, talk about, give a brief summary of the theory. If it's a study, briefly mention the aim, talk about the sample, elaborate a bit on the procedure, and then briefly mention the main results and the conclusions. That's it. No need to give any evaluation. Then you have question 4B, evaluate the psychological explanations. Now, the question for 4A and 4B will be on the exact same topic, as you can see. The difference is one is asking you to describe, whereas the other is asking you to evaluate. Now, what's the difference between describe and evaluate? When you're describing the topic, you're just giving a summary of the topic, all right? If I'm, let's give you an example from Piliavin. If I were to describe the Piliavin study from AS, I would say that it is testing the diffusion of responsibility hypothesis at the New York subway on 4,453 passengers. I would talk about the procedure. I would mention the results and the conclusions. But if I were to evaluate the study by Piliavin, I would have to talk about its strengths and weaknesses. That is the difference between an evaluation and a described question. 
So you should not waste much time giving a summary of the psychological explanations or describing the psychological explanations in part B because you've already done that in part A. So instead, get right into the evaluations. And the big difference between your AS and A2 evaluations is in AS, you were specifically told to write two strengths and two weaknesses. In A2, as you can see, they're not specifically saying to write two strengths and two weaknesses. It's just saying evaluate the psychological explanations of OCD. And in AS, they would give you a particular point that you had to include in your answer, a named issue. Over here, they're also giving you a named issue, which is including a discussion of situational explanations. So this, this is the second main difference between the AS and A2 evaluation. In AS evaluations, your evaluative points would be mostly research method related points. For example, validity, reliability, generalizability, ethics, data, experimental design, um, lab experiment, volunteer sampling, right? So research method related points. They can ask you to use those in A2 as well. But along with that, something new, which you're not used to from your time in AS is using issues and debates in your evaluations. So like over here, individual and situational explanations. This is not something you ever used in your evaluations for AS, but you will be required to use it in A2. So the reductionism versus holism debate, for example, the nature nurture debate, for example, application to everyday life, for example, these are all points that you would be required to use in A2 evaluations. Reason being, not everything is a study in A2. So for example, cognitive, behavioral, and psychodynamic explanations of OCD, none of these are studies. It's not like we have a sample with an aim, with a procedure, with results. So if you don't have a sample, if you don't have a procedure, if you don't have results, then you can't use points like data, ethics, generalizability in your evaluation. So if you can't use those points, then what points are you left with to use for your evaluations? That's where these issues and debates come into play. You can talk about how a particular topic or theory is maybe favoring the individual side or the situational side. It's favoring the nature side or the nurture side. You can talk about its application to everyday life. You, talk, you can talk about how it's reductionist or holistic, right? I won't spend time over here discussing the evaluation format. For that, I'll make a separate video because that would be a lot longer. I just wanted to explain to you what to expect in the exam. So for 4A, there's a described question. For 4B, you have the evaluation question. And like I said, it doesn't have to be on the entire explanations. They've just given you a section, okay? If they wanted, they could have even given you a more specific evaluation. They could have asked you to evaluate only, let's say, for example, the psychodynamic explanations, and they would not have given you cognitive and behavioral. So let me show you an example of that from health. So for health psychology, if you look at question 12A and B, the describe and evaluation, 12A is described the study by Savage and Armstrong on the effect of a general practitioner's consulting style on patient satisfaction. Now, for those of you who studied health psychology, the first chapter, which is patient practitioner relationship, the second section in that chapter is practitioner diagnosis and style. Now you've got a lot of topics there, right? You've got diagnosis, you've got type one, type two error, you've got the Robinson and West study, you've got the Cook and Culver study. Then in the style, you've got the key study by Savage and Armstrong. Now, in the example I showed you for clinical psychology, you had um, the entire psychological explanations to evaluate and to describe, which includes cognitive, behavioral, and psychodynamic. So technically three um, topics that you would have to evaluate or you would have to describe. Over here, they've given, they've given you just one. It's one study. It's a Savage and Armstrong study. It's not a theory, it's a study. And you would just have to describe this one study. So this is very specific. This would be in fact shorter than your answer for the OCD describe and evaluation question because for that, the content is a lot more that they're giving, right? That's three topics. Over here, they're giving you just one. So they can be as specific as this. Okay? They don't have to necessarily give you two, three um, different topics to evaluate. They can give you one very specific, one single study like they have over here. So evaluate the study by Savage and Armstrong, including a discussion about generalizations. Over here, you can use your research method terms because this is a study. 
But even for this, you can use your issues and debates. You can talk about how it's applicable to everyday life or how it isn't. You can talk about if it's favoring the individual side or the situational side. So this is the format for P3. This is what you can expect in P3. Uh, I will make another video to let you guys know what to expect in P4 and how it's different from previous P4s. One thing which I will tell you, which not many people know, the chapters which come in P3 will not be repeated in P4. So you can kind of do self, well, not self, but selective studying for P4. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So let's take a look at clinical psychology. We have five chapters in clinical psychology. I'll write them down. We have um, mood disorders. Let's start with the first one, schizophrenia. We have schizophrenia. We have mood disorders. We have impulse control disorder. We have anxiety disorders. And we have OCD. Five chapters, right? Question number one, what's it on? It's on mood. So mood has been asked. Question two is on ICD, impulse control disorder. Question three is again on mood. Question four is on OCD. So what are the three chapters that they have asked questions on in P3? Mood, ICD, and OCD. What are the two chapters they have not asked on? Schizophrenia and anxiety. In P4, you will have questions only on schizophrenia and, and on anxiety. Nothing on mood, nothing on ICD, nothing on OCD. You're probably wondering, okay, if they've asked about the explanations of OCD, does that mean that only explanations of OCD will not come? And they might ask about, let's say, the diagnostic guidelines or the treatment of OCD? No. If a single question on any part of OCD comes in P3, nothing will be asked about that chapter, that entire chapter in P4. So, the, so if you once once you're done with P3, try to remember the questions which came and try to remember the chapters on which they ask questions. It's always going to be on three chapters. The remaining two which they haven't asked on will come will be the only chapters which will um, be coming in paper four. And the same thing applies to every other module as well. Let's take a look at health. In health psychology, the chapters that you have are the patient practitioner relationship. You've got adherence, you've got pain, you have stress, and you have health promotion. The first question over here is on stress. As you can see, the stress has been asked. Question two is again on stress. Question three is on health promotion. And question four, the evaluation is on, um, it's on patient practitioner relationships, so PPR. Nothing on adherence, nothing on pain. You guys can go and check for yourself, see the P4 specimen paper. I can guarantee you that the section on health will be on questions on only adherence and only pain, not on stress, PPR, or health promotion. So you can do selective studying for P4. So I hope this video was helpful. I will return with a video on P4 very soon and an evaluation uh, format for uh, A2 as well. So stay tuned for more. Um, also, for those of you who are not part of the AS or A2 psychology group that we created on WhatsApp, uh, reach out to me. I'm taking a couple of online classes, revision classes, some paid, some might be free closer to the exam. So for those of you interested, please reach out to me. My number is um, mentioned in the description below. And again, feel free to reach out and I'll add you guys to the groups. Okay, take care.